Welcome to Integrative Oncology Talk, where we discuss the latest science and opinions from leading voices in integrative oncology. Integrative oncology utilizes complementary therapies and lifestyle strategies to help those affected by cancer using personalized approaches and evidence-based recommendations. This podcast is hosted by Dr. Santosh Rao, a medical oncologist and integrative oncologist, and Dr. Judith Lacey, a supportive care and integrative oncology physician. With support from the Society for Integrative Oncology, an international multidisciplinary organization whose mission is to advance the science and education of integrative oncology worldwide. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect views of the participants' workplace or SIO and are not meant to offer medical advice. The information, opinions, and recommendations in the podcast are for general information only. Before making any changes in your healthcare or lifestyle, please discuss with your healthcare provider. Today on Integrative Oncology Talk, I'm going to be joined by Lise Alshuler, who's a naturopathic doctor with board certification in naturopathic oncology, and she's been practicing since 1994. Dr. Alshuler is a professor of clinical medicine at the University of Arizona, where she is the associate director of the fellowship in integrative medicine at the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine. She's the past president and, board, and a board member of the American Association of Naturopathic Physicians and a founding board member, member and immediate past president of the Oncology Association of Naturopathic Physicians. She's co-authored two books, The Definitive Guide to Cancer, now in its third edition, and Definitive Guide to Thriving After Cancer. The American Association of Naturopathic Physicians recognized Dr. Alshuler in 2014 as Physician of the Year. She is the founding executive director of TAP Integrative, which is a nonprofit web-based educational resource for integrative practitioners. She's also the co-host of a podcast, Five to Thrive Live, on the Cancer Support Network about living more healthfully in the face of cancer. She's a practicing naturopathic oncologist and really a wealth of information. On today's podcast, we're going to be talking with Lise on naturopathic oncology, what the training is and how it's practiced, how we can coordinate care and then we're going to get into some specifics on how uh, naturopathic oncologists can help uh, people affected by cancer recover from treatment and in cancer survivorship and discuss the I Thrive plan. We're also going to touch on the topic of COVID-19. Hey, Lise, thanks so much for joining us today on Integrative Oncology Talk. How are you? I'm good. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. And and Lisa and I have been kind of trading, uh, being guests and hosts on each other's shows. Um, you have a fantastic podcast yourself. Um, why don't you start there? Tell us a little bit about your podcast before we move on. Sure. Yeah. Um, my colleague and uh, person I've co-written so, some books with, Carolyn Gazella, and I have run Five to Thrive Live as first a radio show, now a podcast for, you know, I actually haven't really fully counted. I think it's close to 10 years. And um, our show focuses on uh, wellness, really from an integrative perspective for people who've been affected by cancer. So it's not every show is very specific to cancer, although a lot are. We have people speaking about cardiovascular disease sometimes or, you know, resilience. We had a show on resilience uh, just last week. So yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, I hope people check it out. I'm, I'm just curious, what, um, how do you stay motivated for 10 years? I've been doing this for a little over a year and I, I really enjoy it. I, I think I learn a lot, but what have your experiences been just doing this for 10 years? Well, funny thing, when we first started to do our radio show, we did it for one hour, five days a week. And both Carolyn and I co-hosted every single show. Then a couple of years later, we decided, you know, we could alternate hosting. So then we sort of did two shows each and one show together. Then we thought, well, you know, we really don't need to do five shows a week. Why don't we drop it down to two shows a week? And now we're down to one show a week and we alternate hosting. So, you know, it could, because it takes a lot of energy to prepare for a show and, you know, be present with your guest and um, just collect guests and all that. So, yeah, we've we've learned the hard way that doing it too intensely up front is not sustainable, but we've got a good sustainable pattern now. Sounds good. Well, I want to start by asking you about um, some of your training. And, and just for our listeners, um, you're a naturopathic oncologist. So 
I want to know what that means. Uh, first of all, why you decided to to go uh, into naturopathy school? What uh, what attracted you to that? And then uh, to kind of uh, focus on oncology. And then and then tell us what that means to be a naturopathic oncologist, both in training and then in in practice. Yeah. So, um, well, I'll start just a, briefly about myself. I was um, <clears throat> wanted to be a doctor since I was in third grade and was really committed to that path. In fact, when I was accepted to my undergraduate program, I was accepted to what's called a seven-year med program. This is at Brown University. So you're sort of pre-accepted into their medical school. And the purpose of that program was they really wanted people to go through medical school who picked up other more diverse uh, majors. So they were saying, look, you know, rest assured, you're going to get into medical school. You still have to take the MCATs and, you know, do all that, but you can be a music major. Broaden whatever, your horizons. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I did, I went into medical anthropology and wow, did that broaden my horizons. I realized that my view of medicine was very narrow and uh, it really got me thinking, thinking so deeply, in fact, that as I went through another part of that program was I had the opportunity to do observations with doctors really early as an undergraduate. And um, the more I saw, the more I realized it was not what I wanted to do. I had great respect for conventional medicine that I saw, but it really just wasn't where my heart was. And at the same time, I was learning about all these other healing traditions, and I realized this was not my path. So at the very last minute, you know, I took my MCATs. I was like <laughs> literally on the threshold of going to medical school, and I pulled out and um, went to the Peace Corps for a while and just really didn't know what I was going to do. And then I um, had, on the same day, I received two catalogs from two different people for, at that time, it was called John Bastier College of Naturopathic Medicine. And as soon as I read the principles, I thought, this is <clears throat> this is what I want. It was about, you know, a person-centered um, approach that really respected the healing capacity of the individual that sought to use the most natural, least uh, harmful ways possible to stimulate that inherent healing process. Um, just things that really resonated with what I felt and what I'd learned in medical anthropology. So I jumped in and have never looked back. Love, love, love naturopathic medicine. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, at the same time when I was an undergraduate, there was a course that I took where we had some people who had been diagnosed with cancer come in and share their stories. And I was floored by these individuals, their courage, their insightfulness, their wisdom that they seem to have gained through this experience of cancer. And it just really triggered something in me that, you know, I want to work with people that have been going through this illness someday. I want to specialize in cancer care. And um, so I had the opportunity to work at a cancer specialty hospital, uh, Cancer Treatment Centers of America, which was a great opportunity because it was really a way for me to learn conventional oncology at the same time, apply naturopathic medicine in that setting. And uh, right around that time, I participated in creating the the, the specialization in our profession for naturopathic oncology. So a group of us spent a lot of years putting together the requirements and the kind of attributes of that. But really the purpose of naturopathic oncology as a specialist within our, within our profession, we don't prescribe chemo, we don't prescribe radiation, we're not conventional oncologists, but we focus so much on cancer care that we really make it our business to learn as much as we can about conventional care so we can be very informed and then we take our naturopathic training and apply it in a very, you know, very specific context of cancer care. As you know, it's such a complex entity. There's so many ins and outs to it that it really, we felt required the diligence of a specialization to, you know, really develop the skill set to, to be safe and effective in that regard. There are many naturopathic doctors that also see people with cancer, so you don't have to be a naturopathic oncologist, but a naturopathic oncologist is somebody who's, that's really their primary focus, so they're, they're really more steeped in in kind of this area of knowledge. And Well, first of all, I want to say that I, I really appreciate your journey. Um, I remember when I was applying to medical school, um, I had gotten very interested in Ayurveda and traditional Chinese medicine. You know, I don't think... 
uh, maybe it's changed now, you know, and, and I know that we're both uh, did med- medical school a while back or did naturopathic school a while back, but um, it, I don't think I had heard about all these different options. And I know from many years of interviewing medical school candidates that I'd say a, a significant proportion of, of people who go into these programs don't really, really know what they're getting into. So I think the fact that you took the time to really explore what your options are and then and then find out what really hit you um, is is something I think is is uh, you know what I think a lot of people should do. You know I, I think that that's good. Um, I want to get into this uh, this training. Um, so first of all, you know as many people know, to become a naturopathic doctor, you have to go through four years of school and. There's a lot of uh, you know education with that, and then basically most uh, most people will go through some kind of uh, residency training after that. Tell us what the naturopathic oncology training is, and explain what uh, Fabino is. I'm going to share um, the screen also of um, I think this is from uh, one of the um, yeah you might if you can see this you might recognize yeah. this right. So explain yeah. this whole kind of uh, idea and and what the training and what FABNO is? Yeah, so um, FABNO is, stands for the fellow, fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology. So it's, it's really the way that we have attained our fellowship or our specialization in naturopathic oncology. And uh, the requirements have changed over the years of, as the profession has grown and the specialization has taken hold, but essentially now it requires residency um, in naturopathic oncology. So under the supervision of a naturopathic oncologist, uh, there are still some individuals who, because they've been in practice for a long period of time and were not able to complete a naturopathic oncology residency, could qualify uh, for sitting for the exam if they demonstrate a certain number of hours of patient care in um, you know, applying naturopathic medicine to people with cancer and they have to submit the, their cases and so forth. Once people meet those requirements, they then sit for a an examination, which is uh, quite an in-depth and arduous affair, um, and they have to pass that examination. And then we have to be recertified uh, periodically as well. And so really, the you know, the f- purpose of this is, is uh, to gain to help essentially patients find individuals who have focused their naturopathic training into the area of oncology and clearly have demonstrated some competency in the area. Uh, I think right now, no, I might not have this number right, but we're around a hundred, there are about a hundred naturopathic oncologists in the U S and that's important for like certain positions. Like you mentioned CTCA, I think you have to be a naturopathic oncologist or am I wrong about that? Yeah, they've changed a lot of how they staff their centers. I don't. Uh, I think that that is true, and I don't know how many there are working there anymore. But yes, that's that has been the case. Okay, so so for some people are obviously very um, supportive of inclusion with naturopaths uh, in in care, and obviously a lot of patients as well. Um, I'm curious what your experience has been and how that's changed over time with not only the the public, but with uh, medical professionals. Um, you know, you're mm-hmm. a leader in this area, um, and I certainly respect you. And, and you know, how do you feel like uh, the perspective is right now, and how's that changed? You know, it has really changed a lot. Um, I've been focusing on cancer care in my practice for probably solely for the last 15 or so years. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think it's even a little bit longer than that now. Um, so before that I was doing general naturopathic medicine and even over that 15 years, there's really been a very tangible change, I think, in the openness on the part of conventional oncology. And, you know, I have to just first say that conventional oncologists also are in a very difficult position now of a field that's expanding at a really amazing rate. I mean, the number of new medications that are approved is astounding and, the longevity of people's care is grown because the efficacy of the treatment is better. And so it's, there's just so much that conventional oncologists have to keep up with. And um, 
you know, with that viewpoint, then it's really hard for a conventional oncologist to also gain competency in things outside of their training, i.e. things that naturopathic doctors might be more familiar with, like diet and the impact of various nutrients and or mind-body medicine techniques. So, I, you know, I, what I don't see a lot of still, but I understand is conventional oncologists who also, like you're an exception. I mean, you really know these other modalities because you've received training in it, but most just don't have the time to keep up with everything. But what I have seen is that they are more willing to say, okay, I recognize that there are things outside of my realm of knowledge that might have value to my patient. And I'm willing, and in fact, I might even encourage my patient to partake of those things, especially if they're doing that under the guidance of somebody who's skilled at providing them safe and effective recommendations. So I see a lot more willingness for, you know, and I consider that really the ideal model, like this truly collaborative care model where each provider knows their lane, stays to it, does it well, but really respects, recognizes, welcomes other providers of different expertise to come in for the benefit of the patient. I agree. I, I think that we share the same vision uh, in terms of what the model should be. I know that not everybody agrees, though, and that, you know, this is still something that's evolving. And mm -hmm. I'm just looking at uh, the slide here. So this is one potential model where you have the patient in the center, you have conventional care. And then in, in this naturopathic oncology model, you have the naturopath kind of as an umbrella beyond that, and then integrative oncology is, is, an, is an even bigger tent. <clears throat> Let's try to be very specific for, you know, when I talk to my colleagues, for example, um, I know that uh, at some point we wanted to hire a naturopathic oncologist, and there was a lot of confusion about the difference between a naturopathic oncologist and an integrative oncologist. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I remember people asking me, why, why do we need that if we have you? or if we have a dietitian, or, you know, whatever is currently. So can you explain to us what you feel are unique uh, qualities that a naturopath, uh, naturopathic oncologist provides to, to patient care? Yeah. So, you know, I think to your point, uh, maybe we'll start in the unusual situation where a cancer center has the luxury of having not only conventional oncologists, but also an integrative oncologist, because there aren't very many of those either, but there are, you know, it's a growing number too. And, you know, I think that the integrative oncologist definitely brings a wealth and uh, really tremendous asset, it is a tremendous asset to the cancer center and to the patients because, um, you know, like you, for example, you have really deep training in conventional oncology. You've also done a fellowship in integrative medicine. So you've been able to integrate those two things. I think what uh, might be a little bit different is that your sort of um, basis or your foundation is conventional oncology. So you pull in integrative strategies to that, whereas my basis is naturopathic medicine, and I have familiarity but not as in-depth knowledge of the conventional side of things as you do, for example. So I'm going to sort of my starting base are the natural or what we call integrative therapies. So I think that it's a sort of a relative emphasis and comfort and familiarity with the various modalities of integrative medicine that I have. Uh, and I think that's really the advantage of an integrative, uh, sorry, of a naturopathic oncologist is that this is somebody who's really comfortable with, really understands, um, has utilized to a great extent diet, nutritional supplementations, you know, various mind-body therapies, all the components of integrative medicine. So really trust those therapies, understands how to dose them, how long it, they should expect um, a patient to take to react, what to change if a patient doesn't react. Those are things that are hard to learn as a, it takes a long time to kind of pick that up. So I think until an integrative oncologist has been doing these things really regularly for a long period of time, that sort of the kind of the wisdom of the, the medicine is harder to come by. So it just takes a little longer. So in many ways, I think that integrative oncology, naturopathic oncology, conventional oncology, they all complement one another and they reinforce the combined areas of knowledge and then add in some really wonderful strengths. In the best, in the best uh, application, I think that yeah. the 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 counter to that is is so. <clears throat> I think many people are um, 
favorable towards the philosophy of naturopathic medicine, that the body Mm -hmm. heals itself, that nature provides, you know, uh, healing mechanisms per se. And when I have patients, many of them are um, uh, cancer patients, don't want some of the conventional therapy or have this feeling like it's, um, you know, overly aggressive, that it's toxic, et cetera. And many of those people will gravitate towards uh, seeing a naturopathic oncologist. And and they, you know, I see a lot of these people in integrative where I kind of sit in the middle sometimes. Mm-hmm. Um, my first question is, do you feel like the philosophies can mesh where, you know, some people, I, I mean, I think naturopaths are, are quite uh, variable in terms of how they practice and their views on these things. Some people are really, really very um, idealistic about, you know, their views on things um, and they don't believe in chemo or they don't believe in mm-hmm. radiation even um, and that they really believe in in basically that philosophy that the body heals itself. Um, and there are other people who have kind of more nuanced positions and will work with oncologists. Where do you see that relationship? Because I think that because it's a little bit variable, there are situations where we won't get communication or when a patient comes and tells us what the naturopathic oncologist or the naturopath, maybe not even naturopathic oncologist, told them, there's an immediate kind of stop sign that the medical oncologist uh, puts up and there isn't a lot of conversation or meshing sometimes. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I mean, it's a really good point. So I would first say that I think it's very rare for a naturopathic oncologist, so a FABNO, somebody who's who's gone through this training to uh, to express the viewpoint that you described as being sort of the alternative provider. So somebody who doesn't see the value of conventional treatments. That's not really part of our philosophy or our training. So f- that's one really important distinction, I think, between a naturopathic oncologist and Yet, in the profession of naturopathic medicine, there are certainly individuals who, I think, operate more philosophically on that other end of the continuum, like you said, and really eschew any conventional treatment in the, in the face of cancer. Um, and I have to reckon with those individuals much as you do. <laughs> you so what know, do you, I have what do you tell them? Like, what's that? What do you, what do you say? Well, you know, I, I as as respectfully as I can, I, you know, recognize that everybody has a right to their own opinion and <clears throat> that uh, in my view, there is nothing about cancer that is nice. There's, it doesn't play by any of the rules. It breaks all the rules of nature. Uh, it's uh, completely aggressive and it will take over the body if given the chance. Full stop. Uh, there's just no argument with that. So with that perspective, um, and, you know, I feel like we have to pull all stops out as well. And we have to apply. And the, the beauty of conventional treatment is that it too is very aggressive. You know, not as precise as we'd like, perhaps, because there are side effects with it, but that it we need that kind of that intensity of therapy to meet the aggressive nature of cancer. But at the same time, that by itself is not enough either. And it's really a travesty, in my opinion, that people go through conventional oncology and don't get integrative support because they are a person holding this tumor. And there are issues in their body that can make them more or less resilient, more or less resistant to cancer, uh, more or less resistant to side effects. These are things that we, I think, have an obligation to counsel patients about. So... You know, I kind of go into that. I, I think also the other point to this that I would would say is that in in naturopathic philosophy, we um, believe that there's an innate healing capacity, but we but that does not mean that we have the ability to heal fully. And I think that gets misinterpreted sometimes. It, we just have the ability to bring health into our body, but that doesn't necessarily mean we can heal ourselves completely all the time. And we also believe in the healing power of nature. But if you think about nature, nature is not gentle, actually. I mean, there are storms that rage across the planet. And so, you know, understanding that is also very complex, too. And I think that sometimes people can get a little narrow and are simplistic in how they think about things because it kind of helps them create a philosophy, but it's not necessarily... <clears throat> you know, practical. Correct. Right. I, I, I always, uh, I believe in a lot of things, but I, I tell my patients and, and myself, I believe that 
first and foremost, I'm practical. And the more you know, the more tools you have. And, you know, I think that's where the science and research comes in, is that if you show that, for better or worse, this uh, surgery is the way to go, um, I'm not going to argue with that. And uh, this whole kind of, you know, intellectualizing what's happening, we need to understand what's happening in cancer. But it's not like just, you know, changing your diet or just, you know, these supplements, for example, are going to change the whole situation. It's just part of the puzzle. And, and right. we shouldn't fight that. But at the same time, you know, I, I tell people, just don't think so much about uh, the philosophy and whether you agree or don't agree. Let's follow the science. And and on all angles, like, you know, yeah. same thing with the con conventional medical oncologists, you know, and we argue about things, you know, whether it's sugar or whether it's, you know, various things like that. Just follow the science and we should be able to agree on that. And then let's keep building on that science and get better and better at, at caring for people. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. I think that is sort of the common language, you know, and it may be that there is a sort of natural therapy that has good scientific evidence that should be used. If it's less harmful and helpful, that should be used. And I think that the language of science really does sort of even the playing field. The one thing I would say about that is that there's um, this box that I have in my mind, which, uh, you know, for every therapy, you want to evaluate how much benefit could this have and what kind of harm could it have? Because there are some therapies that uh, have been done for a long time in the naturopathic profession that really have no clinical trials, but the risk of harm is basically nil. <laughs> so, you know, those kind of things, I think you have more leeway. Now, where it gets dangerous is when people use those in place of something that has good evidence, whether it's conventional or other, it doesn't really matter. But I think aside from that, you know, it's, it's sort of also <laughs> another way to sort of nuance that science debate. So I want to get into to some of what you recommend. But I first, before we leave this topic, how do you think in an ideal world, um, naturopathic oncologists and medical oncologists should communicate and work together on individual patients? What, what do you do and what do you recommend to others that might be listening? Yeah. You, you know, I think um, uh, in an ideal world, we would get into a room and have a conversation about patients and come up with a collaborative plan. I think in the real world, <laughs> uh, providers are very busy and it's really hard for them to have that kind of time. So, you know, I, I don't, so I don't know if the way I practice is ideal or not, but what I do is I ask and encourage each of my patients to allow me to send a copy of my consultation note to their oncologist. And so that it's in the oncologist's record, whether the oncologist reads it or not, I'm not sure, but I really like that the oncologist has access to it because they can see what I'm recommending, why I'm recommending it, and kind of follow my thought process. And I, at the same time, have copies of their notes in my patient's chart so that I'm also aware of what they're doing. And I find that that is very helpful. And then if there's a point of concern or disagreement or the patient gets confused, I think the most appropriate thing at that point is for the two providers to have a phone call or a conversation to kind of work it out on behalf of the patient. Great. Great. Um, you know, I'm going to share the screen again and, and basically uh, look at a couple of your books that you've written. Um, the Definitive Guide to Cancer, An Integrative Approach to Prevention, Treatment, and Healing, and then The Definitive Guide to Thriving After Cancer, which was the next book. And that's a, a five-step integrative plan to reduce the risk of recurrence and building lifelong health. Uh, just lots and lots of information. I mean, we have uh, we have these books in our in our center. Um, I want to delve into a little bit of specifics here. <clears throat> so, just uh, tell us kind of what you focus on and different scenarios, specifically when somebody. Um, is recovering, let's say, from either chemotherapy or radiation. I think that's a real kind of uh, uh, weak area, I would say, in medical care where many patients feel like, okay, now what do I do? So tell us what you focus on in that setting and uh, what are some of the things that you look for, test, and recommend? Yeah. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, by various studies, about three quarters of all people after conventional treatment, whether it's chemotherapy, radiation, or now biologics, have residual symptoms. And the most common symptom is fatigue. 
this is a very specific type of fatigue. There are very specific underlying uh, kind of path, what we call pathophysiological reasons for it or, or, or sequelae of the treatment that cause that fatigue. Uh, many people have anxiety, depression, weight gain. Some people have weight loss. Uh, some people have residual peripheral neuropathy symptoms. Some people have um, issues with their skin, so, you know, dryness or rashes, uh, you know, sexual dysfunction. I mean, there's just a lot of issues. So the first thing I do is really try to understand the patient's current experience and what is still worse for them or you know, is preventing them from getting back into their life in a in a way that they are looking for. I mean, people's capacity changes. Some people think, I want to get back to the way I was before I was diagnosed. And that sometimes doesn't really work. So it's really about, well, what's your new normal and how can we get you there? And then um, prioritizing that along with that and right underneath that is almost every cancer survivor. And this has also been studied. It's not even related to the type of cancer, or the stage of cancer, but anybody who's been hands, been uh, diagnosed with cancer is concerned about getting a recurrence. So, right. you know, right up there with "let me feel better" is I also want to make sure I don't have to go through this again. What so, can how do I you do? how do you deal with that? Because that's a natural feeling when you feel like your body is not listening. You know, like cancer is basically your body is not listening to you in the right way, or at least part of your body. Um, how do you encourage people to start having faith in themselves and uh, confidence that this may not happen again? Yeah, I mean, I think that a, a lot of people do feel like they've been betrayed by their body uh, with the result of cancer. And I talk to people a lot about, um, you know, the more we understand about cancer, the more we realize that cancer really is um, a culmination of things, some of which are in our control and some of which are not, some of which... Uh, factors happen when we were children and we had no control over it, whether it was environmental, the stress of our childhood has an impact, there are random genetic accidents that happen. And then, of course, we can have lifestyle behaviors that make those things or institute other challenges to our cells that can result in cancer. But the first thing I try to do is just try to broaden their perspective and, you know, let's just not take blame for what's happened and let's just assume that what we do have the control over now is doing everything we can to create more health in our body and to create a body that's more resistant to the development or the redevelopment of cancer. So we can't take our risk down to zero, but we can lower it and let's do everything we can to lower it at the same time, uh, doing it in a way that instills wellness. You know, we could all have a perfect diet and exercise every day and meditate and be miserable in life, right? So we don't want that. We want to have joy and happiness and at the same time be healthy. So, um, but you you do recommend uh, all the things you just said, right? A great diet, <laughs> exercise, meditation. What what are the things that, let's let's talk about the specifics with, let's okay, say, you fatigue. you want to get down to brass tacks. I want to get, yeah. So let's say, <laughs> let's say you see, uh, you know, the normal... A uh, person who's uh, post chemotherapy who has fatigue and some of these other symptoms, neuropathy, those kind of things. Um, what are you looking at? Uh, what are the kind of things that you that you measure, and what are the most effective things that we can do? And we can go through them one by one because I know this is a very broad topic. I mean, if, mm -hmm. I'm sure you would have to read the whole book for us <laughs> to really get into uh, everything. But I'm looking more for what is the approach and okay. how can how can the naturopathic oncology approach kind of enhance, especially in this particular area where I don't think we have a lot to offer in medical oncology? I mean, we we do. We we will focus on symptoms and it's broadening. If you look at NCCN guidelines, for example, and uh, we can work on sleep, we can work on, uh, you know, stress management. Uh, you know, yoga is kind of now part mm -hmm. of the playbook. Um, so all those things are there, but then there's all these other areas that we don't really uh, approach, like micronutrients and, you know, various other aspects that I think you guys focus more on. So, Yeah, so, I mean, it is such a broad thing, but I guess let me just start by saying that I will um, really assess each person individually. So from a symptom perspective, find out what their main issues are. I may also do some laboratory analysis. For example, fatigue, common symptom. Uh, in my experience, the two main, three main contributors to that fatigue are one, nutritional deficiencies, 
uh, or nutrient deficiencies to what we call hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis dysfunction, which invariably results from chemotherapy, and that results in uh, hyper cortisolemia or high levels of cortisol and cortisol resistance, and that causes fatigue, and that actually is an independent prognostic factor for recurrence too, so I really pay attention to that, and you, there are ways to kind of get at that from symptoms, but there are some laboratory tests that can be done too to confirm whether that is there or not. And then the third contributing, main contributing factor is uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, Kind of, I guess a fourth one would be sort of mood disorder, stress, depression, anxiety. So I'll kind of assess for the those four things in somebody with fatigue after treatment and try to determine what the more strongest influences are on the fatigue, and then address that through a combination of diet. So let's just let's just take uh, I don't know, let's pick one. Let's just take nutrient issues. Maybe somebody after chemotherapy is going to be very likely depleted in their endogenous antioxidants. So it's a really good time to replete them with nutrients that will help them regenerate their antioxidants. Things like selenium, for example, or glutathione or vitamin E or vitamin C. So that might be considerations. Um, those can all be obtained dietarily. So this might also be an opportunity for for counsel about making sure people are eating sufficient quantities of vegetables and fruits certain amount of fresh vegetables and fruits, you know, rainbow kind of diet, uh, grains, nuts, seeds, um, that, that sort of thing. Uh, exercise is, you know, going to become a very important part of addressing fatigue. If we think about the mitochondrial dysfunction, probably the best way to regenerate mitochondrial capacity in the body is to reinstitute exercise. And I talk a lot about exercise with my patients. I think it's one of the most impactful therapies actually that we have to offer for survivors. And I talk about finding the edge of their fitness and always staying at that edge. So that edge is going to move a little bit over time, depending on life circumstances during the holidays, the fitness might go down a little bit afterwards might start to come back up, but you're always at that edge. So you're always exercising at a level that's difficult, but fun, you know, it's fun, enjoyable, but it's always challenging to you. Um, and let's see. So, of course, you know, we talk a lot about dietary supplements. People are very interested in that, and, and at least in my experience. And I think that I believe that they have a lot to offer. And there are um, now an increasing number of studies that we can rely on, too. So for depending on the type of cancer that somebody has or is at risk for, the nature of their side effects. So let's say fatigue. Let's say they have a history of breast cancer. Um, I might think about a medicinal mushroom called cordyceps because that has um, evidence to support reduced rec risk of recurrence and it also improves people's energy. That's just a kind of random example. But, um, you know, so really kind of pinpointing and using things that address both symptoms and um, the recurrence issue. And then I think, you know, mind-body medicine therapies are really important as well. I've actually come to believe, like if I was stuck on a desert island and I could only take one survivorship tool with me, what would it be? It would actually be stress management because chronic distress literally unravels every important component of our health. Well, that's from our uh, that, function, and it's just amazing. That's a linker for a lot of these things because you mentioned the HPA axis, you mm -hmm. know, mind body, mitochondrial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. um, so, how how do you uh, help somebody? Um, you know, normalize that cortisol, and and just to be more specific, is 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 what you're measuring a high cortisol level, or I think that from my understanding, there has to be a kind of a cortisol wave where there's a peak, and yeah. and if you don't have, if if you don't have that amplitude and and uh, low point, that's also a problem in, in terms of your kind of your HPA axis and the resilience and all that. Right. So generally what happens is as we experience chronic distress for a period of time, the circadian pattern, which you're calling the wave pattern of cortisol, starts to flatten out and it flattens out at kind of a high level. So our bodies start to see more, our cells see more cortisol than they're used to. And just like with insulin resistance, when there's a lot of insulin around, uh, insulin receptors, where how cells take up that insulin, become resistant they just can only get so much in. They can only use so much. And the same thing happens with cortisol, really. 
Um, and so s- the cortisol, which is normally we think of as kind of an anti-inflammatory hormone and things that sort of keep the body in check, because of the cortisol resistance, we start to see the opposite effects. So people start to get more inflammation. They, you know, linked with high cortisol level are th- things ranging from depression to irritable bowel syndrome to infection to fatigue. And importantly, when people lose that wave pattern, um, they are at higher risk for death from their cancer. And that's been shown in colon cancer, breast cancer, renal cell carcinoma. Uh, so, you know, it's a really important thing to address. And, so and how, do you, how, how do you test it? Will you do like the three times a day testing or what, what do you do? Yeah. So, you know, um, yeah. So the best way to test it is with an adrenal uh, cortisol test. So you you have somebody basically spit into a tube because salivary levels are very good correlates of uh, body levels. Mm -hmm. And they spit into a tube in the morning, around noon, afternoon, and then in the evening and you map it out. And so you can kind of see. So, yeah, the good news is that this is fixable and um, it's fixable with a combination of lifestyle changes. So really encouraging people to get exercise in the morning, do relaxation in the evening. Um, Then uh, the use of what a a category of plant medicine called adaptogens is very important. These are plants that actually impede the resistance. So they break through that resistance and they resensitize receptors to cortisol, which helps that circadian rhythm reestablish. Um, there are, um, along with that, nutrients that address the uh, brain in terms of how it perceives stress. So that n- initial trigger to the system, we need to kind of turn that down too. So, uh, we, you know, those are things that we call nervines in naturopathic medicine, but uh, things like theanine comes up a lot, lavender extracts, um, even s- certain amino acids like um, glycine or even GABA can be used. I mean, there's so many options like, you know, magnesium, lots of, lots of ways, literally dozens and dozens of strategies. And those are things so, that we don't think about at all, <clears throat> typically. Um, right. What are some of your favorite adaptogens? I mean, you mentioned, you know, mushrooms, ashwagandha probably, or. Mm-hmm, I love ashwagandha. Um, and that's a unique one because it's it has a bit of a sedative quality. Most adaptogens are a little bit more energizing. So ashwagandha is particularly good when people are having trouble sleeping. And that's a common issue for people who have gone through cancer treatment as well. So I love ashwagandha for that reason. I actually usually dose it in the evening. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and then in the morning, I like adaptogens like American ginseng, um, I like something called rhodiola or holy basil. I mean, again, there are many of these, and sometimes I'll combine them into a formula, or there are many formulas that have already been made by manufacturers, and I'll recommend those to sort of get a complement of, of the different components of these plants. So you use rhodiola in the morning? I do, yeah. Okay. Rhodiola is very, um, it has some antidepressant properties, but it's also very uh, mentally stimulating. So it's particularly good in the morning because it helps people kind of get a clear mind and move through their day a little bit more with more ease. Well, I mean, my my point in asking all these questions is, first of all, just for people to get an idea of how um, how much depth there is in this topic. We can't certainly cover everything, but just the, the utility of it, because um, just even some of the things you rattled off, I don't think we really address, first of all, and I don't think that most of us in conventional medicine have the tools because mm-hmm. unless you're used to looking at some of these levels or used to using some of these um, various uh, supplements, for example, um, it's hard to really, you know, feel like you're competent, you know? Right. Um, yeah. And I'm glad you said that because I think this is really an area where um, integrative therapies, naturopathic included, uh, offer something unique and important. I mean, the ba- you know, the, I think really a key take home is that people who go through treatment don't have to have fatigue for 10 years. <laughs> and it's not the kind of fatigue they can just sleep off. There are things that are wrong in their body that need to get supported. Well, I want to uh, talk about your, your survivorship uh, care, because I think that's mm-hmm. a real focus um, that you have. And um, I know that you've talked to us about that as well. Um, tell us a little bit about iThrive and the iThrive plan. 
Um, you and and uh, Carolyn have done a lot of work on this, creating a whole survivorship, you know, platform. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, and what are the what are the things that you focus on? Yeah, so uh, this is an online uh, personalized program. So what we did is we we took a lot of the um, key components of wellness and we put them into a uh, online program that allows people to to basically self-pace their way through a very personalized application. So the uh, people can join this for free either on the site you're showing, ithriveplan.com, or this is also the survivorship plan that the a American Institute of Cancer Research uses, AICR.org. And they're a amazing organization, uh, well-respected around the world, and they have a lot of other tools on their website as well. So either place, you can get access to this. And essentially what happens is you start with a survey, and then the survey basically gives you um, your areas of strength in terms of you know your movement, your diet, your rejuvenation, your spirit, and then your environment. And within those areas of strength, you then are presented with what we call action steps. Each action step is clinically evidenced. So we use clinical science to back it up and we break each, each action step into baby steps. So there's a tiny thing you do every day uh, and you complete the action step over five days and you can work on two at a time. So the idea is that you're building habits by doing just one little thing every day, but all connected towards uh, an ultimate goal. You're, you're going to ch- bring about very easy but important changes into your life. So the goal is really to help you build your own wellness. And again, it's all very specific to um, improvement of health after the experience of cancer. Yeah, it's it's amazing. And you can personalize this based on, on, you know, what your center wants to look at, right? You can Mm -hmm. set it up where, uh, you know, in terms of the feedback that patients are getting, um, how often um, you know, they're getting, uh, you know, kind of flagged for, for, uh, action steps, like you said, and follow-ups and those kind of things, right? Right. Yeah. We have some cancer centers actually that have implemented this as well. So they use it not only to give their patient a way to, um, build their wellness, but also it helps them to get triggered when there's an issue or a concern going on with their patient. Have you guys done studies or seen an impact yet that you can that you can talk about? Funny that you ask. We've actually uh, tried. We almost had a study funded a couple of years ago, and we're we just put a we're collaborating with an organization in Georgia, and we just put in um, a study proposal. So hopefully that will get funded, and we'll get some nice outcome data. Awesome. Um, you know, you're also really involved in um, <clears throat> education at the University of Arizona, uh, uh, the Andrew Weil Integrative Medicine Fellowship. You're the assistant director, right, of the fellowship program? Yeah, associate director. Associate director, right. Um, so tell us a little bit about your thoughts on where we're at right now with education. <clears throat> I mean, I, I had a, a previous guest just last week talking about um or just last episode, just talking about this as well. And Mm -hmm. I think that there's so much going on uh, in the field. And um, at the same time, one of my concerns is that oncology and the amount of research and evidence in conventional care is exploding. And so things like immunotherapy, which we use all the time, it's hard for us to catch up with these ancient techniques and now apply it to something brand new. And and that's an area that's very interesting with the microbiome and immunotherapy and things like that. So there's a lot of application, but it's hard to keep up. And um, how do you see that all, you know, how can we better keep up and how can we better educate and uh, continue to mature this field? Yeah, it's such a good question. You know, so the fellowship is really, um, I mean, it's a two-year fellowship, so it's, there's nothing superficial about it. It's very in-depth, but at the same time, it's a survey, really, of integrative medicine. So I think fellows emerge through that fellowship with, um, you know, great competence in core areas of integrative medicine and familiarity with a lot of other areas so that they're very equipped to practice a lot of it and then to refer 
to make good qualified referrals for others, um, other areas, but it for, it creates a platform from which they can continue to apply what they've learned and to develop it even further, you know, within their specialty or even within a area within their specialty, like let's say immunotherapy. So if somebody who's gone through the fellowship in integrative medicine is going to have a very deep understanding of the microbiome the, um, you know, what it is, how it affects health, the ways that we can manipulate it. And with that knowledge, we'll be much better, I think, equipped to find and understand research related to the microbiome and immunotherapy. And so we'll kind of be at the forefront of um, an area that's still developing. I mean, there are still studies coming out, some of which are conflictual. So we still don't really know the final answer, but I think somebody who has training in this area will be able to study the question and to come up with the best educated response to whatever, you know, patient situation is in front of them. Um, and hopefully we'll even be in some of, you know, designing some of the studies that we need in this area. I mean, you're right. You know, I think oncology is a good example. There's just so much happening and it's, you know, even in my perspective, I mean, I've been prescribing prebiotics, probiotics for decades. And I'm a little bit, I don't know what to do with immunotherapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we know we need microbial diversity in the gut and, you know, how we best achieve that, the timing of it. Those are all questions that I don't fully understand yet. Well, uh, I want to finish on, um, you know, one of the topics of the day, which is COVID. <clears throat> I've talked to a lot of people about this, but you're another person I want to talk to because uh, because you're a naturopathic oncologist. You know, what are some of the things that uh, we probably don't think about? And I'm going to share here, um, you know, you had created through University of Arizona's uh, fellowship website, um, some considerations, integrative considerations during COVID pandemic. Um, what are some of the things that uh, maybe you think people aren't doing right now or things that we should be focusing on to boost our immunity and reduce uh, some of the severity potentially from COVID-19? So I think, uh, uh, let's see, there's some, there's a lot again that we can do, but you know, clearly I, I don't want to minimize this, but I'm just going to gloss over it. But the foundations of stress management, good, healthy diet and good, adequate sleep are really critical because we are handicapping our immune system if we don't pay attention to those areas. So I think that's one thing. Um, so having said that, uh, just for the purposes of maybe something that people aren't as aware of, I think there is really a role for uh, dietary supplementation. Now, there's not a lot of clinical studies on this yet, but what we know about COVID is that <clears throat> the way in which our innate immune response meets the virus and then kind of hands it off to the adaptive immune system is really critical. And there are some therapies that we have that, that strengthen our innate immunity, um, which I think is really important in, in prevention. So from a prevention standpoint, that's really where I would focus. And so I think about things like making sure that people are not deficient in vitamin D, that they have vitamin D sufficiency. I think that's in, very important. And what do you, what um, do you quantify that as? <clears throat> so yeah, good question. So technically it's 20 nanograms per milliliter, but I really like to see somebody at least at 30 nanograms per milliliter. And there's some, some research that suggests for, for um, optimal innate immunity, we may need vitamin D more around 40 nanograms per milliliter. And is that same for uh, every race? <clears throat> because it, uh, Yes. Yeah, that's a little bit of a misnomer, you know, because uh, darker darker individuals with darker skin pigmentation aren't as efficient as making vitamin D, but they make up for it in other ways through diet and so forth. So, yeah, I think everybody needs to have at least, I would say, 30 to 40 nanograms per milliliters. Um, then I think about things like uh, there are some herbs which have historically been used to lower the risk of viral infections, things like elderberry, um, things like astragalus, uh, things like andrographis. These are all herbs which really very specifically increase the that initial immune, the innate immune cells, natural killer cells, macrophage. They increase the function of those cells and the ability to um, kill the virus upon first exposure, which I think is what we need to try to, you know, if we can do that effectively, 
and reduce the viral load that enters our body, the chances of having the sequelae of the infection go way down, That those inflammatory sequelae. So that's kind of where I would focus. Zinc <clears throat> is another one that comes to mind. Right. And that's something that we don't usually measure very often, right? Do you do you measure zinc levels? And if You know, so- I don't. I mean, I, well, I do sometimes. And, uh, you know, usually I, if I want to try to get a sense of it, I do red blood cell zinc levels, which is a more specialized lab test. But I think that um, in terms of viral prevention, what we're really talking about is a zinc lozenge because we want to have zinc absorbed in the upper respiratory tract mostly because it it the way it works is to prevent try to prevent viral penetration. So we want that to be very active where we're going to be more likely exposed to it. So and you know there's some data to support that zinc lozenges may in fact reduce uh, not covid we don't have that data yet but other viral uh, respiratory infections. So I think it kind of makes sense that's I mean, certainly are you- low risk are you aware of studies um, looking at severity of COVID and these vitamin deficiencies, which which are very prevalent? Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, the only one I'm aware of is uh, vitamin D. There have been some retrospective studies that have looked at vitamin D levels and severity of COVID, and there's clearly an association. Again, people who are deficient are at much higher risk for getting COVID, for getting really sick with COVID, and in fact, for dying with COVID. Uh, that's been shown both in retrospective studies, population studies, and then most recently there was a randomized trial that was done in northern India that uh, used vitamin D, dosed people up really high who had mild COVID symptoms, and those who had high vitamin, who were able to achieve vitamin D sufficiency. If I recall, I think in the study they were looking to get people actually to 50 nanograms per milliliter, that those individuals had a much lower viral load and less uh, severe, le- less likelihood of having severe symptoms. So that's the first randomized control trial that I'm aware of. But And that's just vitamin D. You know, I think there are other nutrients that I think are impactful that we don't have studies on. Essential fatty acid levels, magnesium levels, vitamin C levels, zinc levels. I think the these vitamin B, you know, various vit- uh, B vitamins, thiamine especially, we just need more studies. We don't have them yet. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough, but this is happening in real time, and we focused on it throughout the year because this is really uh, affecting all of us in different ways and the whole planet. And I think there there are strategies that uh, we talk about in integrative oncology that can really help. You know, whether it's stress management, sleep. And some of the very interesting things that that you talked about here today. So um, I could keep talking to you. I mean, you're a fountain of information. Uh, I do encourage people to check out not only your podcast but your your books, uh, which are which are really very very um, you know filled with a lot of information. Uh, so you know, thank you for for joining us today, and thank you for all you're doing as a leader in our field. Well, thank you. I really appreciate having you on, having me uh, be here. And I just want to say that I am so grateful that you're in the world of podcasting and doing what you do and making changes in the way that you are, which are many. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure today. Thanks so much, Lise. Take care. Okay. Bye.